mail. We get lots of advertisements even on our phones now, on our email. And advertisers, it seems like, are trying more and more to get our attention uh, by promising certain things, and then we've got to figure out if it's really true or not. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Lane Bryant, the women's clothing store, uh, put out this ad that said 40% um, off entire store on absolutely everything. And then right underneath that, it says excludes, and then it lists off all these different brands. No, absolutely everything. So a couple of years ago also, Dell put out this ad about a new laptop. Um, it says in that white text over there, it says, finally the power you crave in the thinnest 15-inch laptop on the planet. And then in that tiny black paragraph of text, it describes that it's only the thinnest when you compare it with certain brands of laptops. <laughs> it says we didn't compare it to all these others that are thinner than the Dell. Uh, we got an advertisement uh, in the mail just the other day for AT&T to leap into great savings on, I haven't even read the app, you know, for direct TV and some other things. And I was astounded at all this little print down here. I didn't even read it because I don't think I'm going to understand all of it when I actually read it. But we got to read the fine print on things. This past year, we spent the whole year looking at what we call the big picture. Anybody remember the big picture? Okay, good. At least we've, we've got it in our heads. We looked at the big picture because we're trying to capture what is that big message or that big thing that God is trying to tell us when we look at the Bible overall. You know, we looked at stories across the Bible, especially some of the biggest stories. Stories from creation to Noah and the rainbow to Moses and the Exodus to the prophets to Jesus to Paul. To, I mean, we look across the entire Bible trying to see what is it that emerges from the Bible as the big picture. You know, if we're going to get anything from the Bible, we're going to get this. And so what we came away with was if there is a big picture, and there are probably several, but at least the big picture that we started to discover is that God wants a relationship with us. Yeah. And everything in the Bible points to the fact that God created us for a relationship with Him. God works so that we can have a relationship with God. And so this whole idea that God wants a relationship with us seems to flow out of the Bible. And it was so neat to discover that relationship come forward as we read through the whole Bible. But once you get to the big picture, and we get this idea that God wants a relationship with us, how does that actually work? You know, what, how do we live out that relationship? Or what does that actually mean? And what are the details? What are the conditions of that relationship? You know, how does it actually work? Did you ever notice that down in the corner of the big picture, there's an asterisk. And when you see an asterisk next to something, what does that mean? Yeah, there's more to the story here. I mean, the big picture is great, and the big picture is true, and the big picture is what we need. But there's more to it. You know, how do I actually live in a relationship with Jesus? How does that relationship with Jesus impact what I do at 9 o'clock every day? How does that relationship with Jesus impacts how I speak to different people? How does that relationship with Jesus influence how I use the stuff I have? I mean, there's so many questions that we could ask about what does it mean to actually live in this relationship that God created us for? Well, that's the fine print. Wow. You know, if we're to read through the Bible, there's a lot of fine print. There's a lot of detail about how this relationship works out. You know, this fine print, it, it can help us see our relationship with God in action. It can help us make the choices and make the decisions that we all have to make every day. It can guide us and direct us in the right way so that we can make wise kinds of choices. This fine print that the Bible offers us throughout the Bible can help us to step in to this relationship that God creates for us. Now, did Jesus give us a lot of fine print? Did Jesus give us a lot of fine print? Oh, yes. He gave us a ton of fine print. I mean, he gave us rules, and he gave us laws, and he gave us ways to live. He gave us stories and examples. He gave us lots of fine print. 
And what better place to look at some of the fine print, or to start looking at the fine print, than to look at the biggest teaching that Jesus ever gave, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And right at the beginning, Jesus starts in with some fine print. So Jesus goes like this. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and walked on like it's worthless. Now, at first glance, I have to wonder, why did Jesus start talking about salt? You know, out of all the things that he could have talked about, why did he talk about salt? Because for us, salt isn't that big a deal. I mean, we buy salt at the store for 79 cents, and we bake with it, and we sprinkle food with it, and we do some other things with it. There's probably a salt shaker on just about every table at home or in a restaurant. There's always salt around, if we need it, just in case. Uh, we, we use salt especially if we like ice cream. We like rock salt. It helps us make good ice cream. We sprinkle salt on the roads to melt the snow and let us drive on the roads. We use lots of salt. But I'm not sure we depend on salt. At least in the same way that Jesus' world depended on salt. They depended on salt. They had to have salt. Salt was everywhere in the days of Jesus. It was up in the landscape. It was everywhere, especially on Mount Sodom, next to the Dead Sea. The mountain is made of salt. And then down below, next to the Dead Sea, there's salt everywhere. There's, they looked out and they saw salt. It even influenced how their water tastes. Salt seeps into everything that they do every day. They can taste it. There's something with salt in it, seemingly everywhere. Salt also was a way that people got paid. You know, we write checks, and we charge credit cards, and we pay cash. They paid people in blocks of salt because it was that valuable. It was that difficult to mine, and so they paid people with something valuable. So salt was their salary. That's where the word salary comes from. Salt was incredibly necessary for them. And in a world without refrigeration, they covered their meat. They covered their food with salt to preserve it. They depended on salt. So when Jesus is talking about us as the salt of the earth, he's talking to people who depended on this salt. I mean, he's saying this thing that you know about, this thing that you taste, this thing that's everywhere, this thing that supports your life, this is who I'm calling you to be. To be valuable, to be important, to be essential, to be crucial to the world that you live in. That's us. We're, we're salty. And Jesus isn't just telling us things that we're supposed to do. I mean, he's not just telling us the eight ways to be salty or here, check off being salty and then you're going to be fine. He's not teaching us all the things that we have to do to be salty. He's telling us you are salt. You are the salt of the earth. And Jesus is really, I think, casting a vision for who God created us to be and who Jesus is calling us to be. Because it's not the stuff we have to do, it's who we are to become. And part of what Jesus says when he says, you are the salt of the earth, is he says, don't lose your saltiness. I mean, listen to it. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? How can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and walked on like it's worthless. I mean, we're salt. We're vital. We're crucial. But we can't mess it up. We can't get rid of it. We can't shake it out. We can't get rid of our saltiness because that's part of who we are. So what is it that makes us salty? I mean, in the passage, Jesus just says, you're salt. Jesus declares that we are salt. What makes us salty is the big picture. It's our relationship with God. If there's anything that makes us vital and important and crucial to God's world, it's the fact that God made us this way. That's how we live out a relationship with God. We live it out by being the salt, by doing things that God calls us to do, by living in a certain way. And God lets us be part of what God's doing. So then Jesus keeps going. And he says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. 
Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You know, unlike salt, which may require a little bit of ancient history work to just figure out what is it all about and what does it mean, light is light. There's nothing ancient or modern about light. Light is just light. You know, when the room gets dark, we need light. When the sun goes down, we need light. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Shine out for all to see. And let your good deeds shine out so that people can praise your heavenly Father. When I was growing up, my grandparents lived in one house, that house, in Hastings, Nebraska, for over 50 years. So it was the only house I ever knew that they lived in. And so when we went to visit them, this is the house that we went to. And it was one of those typical Great Plains kinds of houses. Uh, it has a screened-in porch in the front, uh, not altogether that large, uh, but it had a huge basement down below. And you got to the basement from the kitchen in the back of the house, and you went down a couple of stairs, and then turned on a landing down a long staircase to this basement. And at least in my grandparents' basement, it, it had a couple functions. Uh, on the one hand, it was an enormous storage room that you, you emptied down the stairs into this large room that I remember was filled with boxes and bins of all kinds of different stuff. They had Christmas decorations, and they had comic books, and they had uh, toys to play with. I mean, it was just a mess of bins and boxes, and they didn't even try to clean it up. It was just a mess, and that was okay. Over on the other side of the basement was their their pantry or their cellar. And they had a huge chest freezer, and then they had lots and lots of shelves with canned goods and dry goods and other things filling this whole side of the basement. And then on the far end of the basement, as you walked through between these two areas, was a bedroom. And it was actually my dad's bedroom when he was growing up. So for my sister and I, it was always a competition to see who got the basement room. Because it was the coolest room ever. It was all by itself. The one thing the basement did not have was a bathroom. Well, I won the competition one time to see who got the basement bedroom. And I was super excited. So I got the basement bedroom and I went to bed. And in the middle of the night, I needed a bathroom. So I got up in the middle of the night and I started to walk out the door. And all I could see was black. It was pitch dark. There's no windows in a basement. It was so dark. So I'm walking out of this room like this because what I remember is that there's a pull string off a of light somewhere in the middle of that basement. Somewhere between all the boxes and bins and stuff I can trip over and somewhere between all the freezer and everything over here, I know there's a way to get to that light, which I have no idea where it is. So I'm walking around like this, trying to find this string, and I finally grab it because I felt it, and I pulled it, and all of a sudden, I knew where I was. When Jesus calls us to be the light of the world, it's not because I need a light. It's not for any of you because you need a light. It's because the world needs to know where the world is. And when Jesus calls us to let our good works shine out for all to see, it's not for me. It's not for you. That's not why we do stuff. It's for the world to know where it is. It's living in the world that God made. It's living in a relationship that God has blessed the world with. It's to let the world see who God is and what God's doing. It's to let us also to be part of God's mission. Because God's mission is to let the whole world see that God is God. In fact, the, the word mission comes from a Latin word which literally means to send. Which basically means that if God has a mission, God is sending. God, is, in order to accomplish God's mission, God has to send. That means God sends. God is a sending God and he sends you and me. Well, the fun thing, too, is that when Jesus said both these things, this, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, when he, when he says you are these things, he's not saying, you know, you, 
and you, and you, and you, and you, he means all of you. Because the you he's using is plural. He's saying you people, you all who try to follow God, all of you people who are trying to do this relationship, you all, you are the light of the world. We, and every other person in the world who strives to follow God in some way, we are the light of the world to help the world see where the world is. This is a huge blessing and a huge opportunity for us to be valuable and important to God's mission and to help people see where they are. Let's pray.